Hi, I'm Pastor Don Cherry of the Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stevens City, Virginia. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for our worship service. We're hoping that it'll be a blessing to you, be an encouragement to you, and even a little bit of a challenge to you as we look into the Word of God together. So I hope that you'll follow us, have your Bible out, and all join in with us and join us as we go into the Word of God this morning. May it be a blessing to you. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, however good we think that we are, it pales in comparison for what Christ did for us on the cross. You know that. You know, sometimes we get callous about things. We get wrapped up in everything in life. And, you know, we look at things that are going on and say, well, you know what, I'm not like that. I'm, you know, I'm not too bad of a person. But, you know, when we consider that Christ died for each and every one of us, for each and every one of our sins, that ought to bring things into perspective of just how amazing grace is and how wonderful the love of God is. Amen. Now, I'll take your Bibles this morning, if you would. I'm going to invite you to Luke chapter 16. Um, this is not going to be kind of a typical feel-good message, all right? And not that I come into the pulpit each Sunday thinking that and everything, but, um, you know, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and, and, and righteousness, for correction. Okay, so the Word of God obviously has a purpose. And without doing damage to that, I'd like to add kind of one more category. I think the Word of God is also good to bring things into remembrance. You know, sometimes we just need to remember things. It's kind of called refresher courses, right? You know, sometimes in your job, you do that. Okay, you take a refresher course. And everything you have to go, you have to sit down in front of the computer or whatever it may be, and you have to kind of update on stuff, you know, just to refresh your mind on some things. And I believe the Word of God is like that. You know, that as we get into the Word of God, we read it, we consider it, we apply it, and everything, it's a refresher course to remind us of the truth of God's Word, to remind us that it is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And in Luke chapter 16, there's a very familiar passage of Scripture that I want to read before we get into the uh, message this morning. So I hope that you will bear with me. Beginning in verse 19. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Now it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime received the good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. You're tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from you. Then he said, I pray therefore, Father, that you'd send him uh, to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. The one rose from the dead. Thank you, Father, for the reading of your word this morning. Father, help our minds now and our hearts to be attuned. And we ask that your spirit move in a way, Father, that we would gain from this. Lord, that we would be reminded maybe of that which we have forgotten. And Lord, we just want to thank you for your amazing grace. 
and how sweet the sound of it is. And Lord, we just give you honor today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We are all, I heard an evangelist friend of mine some years ago say that, you know, we're all children of our generation. There are certain things of our upbringing that we like. Some, some of those things we'd like to go back to, okay? Uh, this last Christmas, I might have shared it with you, but I received a, a CD set. And it was, you know, I asked my wife, because I know she's always, um, you know, she gets the Christmas presents and everything. I said, honey, I think I found what you could get me for Christmas. Okay, anybody ever done that? Okay, you kind of pick out your own gift. But um, uh, it was a time life set of the 60s, you know, back there. And that was my teenage years, you know, late 60s, early 70s, and all. That's the music that I resonate with. Okay, I like that kind of stuff. You know, so uh, there might be some of you here, the age, and, you know, some big band stuff or some swing stuff from the 40s and 50s, you know. Um, others are younger and you like kind of up until the 90s and, and, and all like that. And that's fine. That's the music that we were raised on. You know, so I kind of gravitate to the 60s and 70s. And there is a song by uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears that said, When I Die. When I Die. Maybe you've heard that song. You know, and one of the phrases in that song is that um, I pray or how does it say? He said, um, I swear there ain't no heaven, and I pray there ain't no hell. You might have heard that. I swear there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell. And then he says, only by dying will tell. You know, only by dying will tell. Well, I think when we look into the scripture, we can see that the, the writer of that song, you know, was it um, uh, Michael Clayton Thomas, I believe, you know, was, was, the, was the lead singer of that it was obvious that he probably didn't get into the Word of God a whole lot. Although, and everything, was it he, Eric, that later on did become a child of God, you know, did become a born-again Christian, you know, so, you know, uh, somebody certainly took the Word of God to him. But I want you to think of that. I swear there ain't no heaven, and I pray there ain't no hell. And we have various different philosophies in our culture today when it comes to eternity or life past this life. You know, there are those that say, well, heaven and hell are right here on earth, right? And everything, it's what you make up. You make up heaven, you make up hell, you know, whatever, we right here. And then there's those that say, well, I'm hoping there's a heaven. But you know what? I sure hope there's not a hell. You see, so we have those various philosophies. But when we look into the Word of God, you know, God, it's very determined in there. And that's why I say that the Word of God is good for remembrance, okay? Because we do, we want to hear the good stuff. Maybe we want to hear the stuff of when we come will make us feel good when we walk out the doors. But, you know, we need, from time to time, I believe, we need to be reminded of reality, okay? And the reality, particularly when it comes to eternity. And I think because, you know, uh, in that song, he said, only by dying will tell. Well, you know what? You know, after death, okay, it, it's a done deal, right? You know, there is no uh, going past go. There is no get out of jail. There is no collecting $200. I mean, it's a done deal. You know, once we pass from this life. And I think, so that's why it's very important that we understand these things, that we look into passages like this and be reminded of the reality of eternity. So um, I want to kind of kind of break this down as we go through it a little bit. And of course, we see two men with two very different destinations. Now, I do want to bring out a couple things, okay? Um, uh, being poor is not a guarantee of getting to heaven. Being rich is not a consignment to hell. We realize that. The purpose of what Christ is telling us here is that there is one of two eternal destinations. Okay? That's what he's getting across. That's the point that he's getting across, and that's what we need to grasp on today. And then, also we need to understand that physical death does not bring existence to an end. You know, there are those who say, well, when you die, that's it. It's over with, you know. Or maybe you go out into limbo. Or, you know, some people will think that, you know, if you, if you lived a good life here on this earth, you know, then you're going to come back as a, as a rose, as a lily, or you're going to come back as something gentle, you know. But, you know, if you were one of those scoundrels and everything, then I don't know, maybe you'll come back as a rattlesnake. I don't know how it works, you know. But this is just a mentality out there, you know, that, that people have. But yet, you know, again, God's Word. That is true. God's word that, you know, and here's the thing about God's word we need to understand. Okay, every word of God's word is settled in heaven, right? Is that what the word of God teaches? And that not one bit of, you know, heaven and earth may pass away, the Bible says, but God's word's going nowhere. So here's the thing we need to grasp this morning. 
that when you and I, like the singer of that song, when I'm dead and gone, guess what? The Word of God's still going to be here, honey. You know, it ain't going nowhere. Everything. So it would, it, would, it would really benefit us to dig in and grasp that, hey, this is the truth of God. Man, this is truth. And I better hang on to that. So one thing I want to point out as we, as we go down into this, there are some that would say this is a parable. All right? And, of course, Jesus is teaching many parables. And a parable is just simply an object lesson. How many of you, either as a Sunday school teacher at one time or in Sunday school, you remember object lessons? Okay? We remember those things. Those were visuals that were brought in to help us understand a little bit more. Okay? And I can really relate to that because I'm a visual learner. You know, if you tell me how to do something, I might get a little bit of it. But if you show me how to do something, I'm going to grasp much more of it, okay? That's just how I'm made up, okay? I, I'm a visual learner of that. So what, what Jesus is telling here, what Jesus is telling here and everything is an object lesson. He's using visuals to communicate a spiritual reality, a spiritual truth, okay? So um, uh, and the reason we know that this is not a parable, there's a couple things I want to point out. One is parables never use specific names. Never use specific names. Now, we see in here there are some specific names. There's Lazarus. There's Abraham, okay? You don't find those in other parables and such. So, um, evidently, you know, this is an actual account that Christ is pulling from. And, of course, he's God. He would know that, okay? He would have knowledge of that. So, specific names uh, are, are not used in parables. Also, Jesus said that they existed. Jesus said these people existed. This actually happened, all right? How many of you seen, um, you remember the bumper sticker? It's been years ago. I hadn't seen one in years, but you remember years ago. It said, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You remember that? You seen all that and everything? And that really sounds good, okay? And maybe somebody pulled up behind you sees that, and they say, hey, yeah, hey, man, you know, hold on, whatever. It may be, you know, they'll agree with that. But here's the thing. If God said it, then, honey, that settles it whether you want to believe it or not. Okay? That is God's word. Okay? And it's not based on whether you believe it or not. It's God's word. Okay? So it's going to be, that's kind of like, um, how many of you have seen the one um, that says, uh, um, God is my co-pilot? Remember that one? Okay? God is my co-pilot? No. Well, um, our church in Ohio, I had, a, um, I had a pilot with Continental Airlines who was a member of our church. And uh, he took myself and a youth pastor there to Cleveland Hopkins Airport one time to show us the plane that he flies. He took us through it, took us up into the uh, air traffic control tower. I mean, it was really a neat tour. And we got to the, then to the cockpit of the plane, and he was pointing out, you know, the different things and where, you know, different people sat and everything. And so I asked him the question. I said, okay, so you got a co-pilot. So what's his purpose? He said, absolutely nothing said, unless something happens to me. If I become incapacitated, the co-pilot takes over. Other than that, he just sits there. You know. And so you think about that for a minute. God is my co-pilot. What are we saying? God, you sit there until I need you. Right? You sit there until I need you. And then I like the one that came out after that and says that if God's your co-pilot, change seats. Okay? Because he's the one that needs to be flying the plane. Amen? He's the one that needs to be calling the shots. He's the one that needs to be guiding and such. But um, um, th th this is just what we need to learn from God's Word. God's Word is God's Word. And folks, after you and I are long gone, you know what? It's still going to be here. And it's still going to be true. Uh, the other thing is that uh, parables never refer to Old Testament saints. Okay? And here we have Abraham being referred to. Luke, who is obviously the gospel writer here, does not refer to this account as a parable as he did others. When you read the parables, that's how Luke refers to them. You know, Jesus spoke a parable. Jesus, you know, a parable. But here you don't see the word parable. So we, from that inference and everything, this is an actual account. Okay, this actually took place. And then hell, or Hades, as it's referred to um, in, in the original there, is a reality. It is not a figure of speech. Okay. Jesus is using an actual account of a reality that took place in, all, in the lives of these two men. Now, let's break it down. You've got two men here. 
Here was a poor man, had absolutely nothing in life, just desired to be fed from the crumbs from this rich man's table. And by the way, when, the, when we get down to the scripture that says when the beggar died, you know, the rich man died, we don't know the time frame in there. You know, doubtful that, you know, the beggar just wanted the crumbs there and dropped over dead, and the rich man dropped over dead. It could have been a time frame in here. We, we don't know that, okay? But the reality is we need to understand and everything is this. And all that we're going to die, okay? You got that? Those of you that think in this body you're going to live forever, you know, got news for you, it's not going to happen, okay? The other thing is there is a destination after this, okay? There is a reality after this, okay? There is no ceasing to exist. There is no going into limbo. There is a reality after this. So it's mentioned Abraham's bosom, which in other uh, places, in particular in the Gospels, and all is referred to as paradise. Okay, same place. And all matter of fact, you might remember uh, 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 Jesus on the cross and his conversation with the thief. You know, remember what he told the thief: "Today you will be with me where in paradise." Okay. No, it, 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 interesting. Jesus didn't say, "Today you'll be with me in heaven." He didn't say that, did he? He said, you will be with me in paradise. This same place as Abraham's bosom. Now, the word paradise itself is descriptive of a lush, well-watered garden type setting. So what comes to your mind when you think of that? Eden, right? Garden of Eden. And when you read of the Garden of Eden, what it, 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 it's lush. It's peaceful. It's well-watered. It's perfect in every which way. You know, that God created for his creation to live in there in the beginning. So that's what it's descriptive of. Uh, and this paradise is also part of Hades. Now, Hades and all is translated to hell and everything, but it just simply means the place of the departed. It's a place people go once they depart this life, okay? Back in this particular point of time. That's what I want you to get a hold of, okay? We're talking here, you know, in the gospel times, all right? So I want you to understand and everything, this is not heaven. This is not heaven where this poor man went. It's not heaven at all. It is yet comforting because we even see there. That's the message that was read. He was comforted, okay? He was comforted. He was at ease. He was at peace in this place. And then for the saints who died prior to Christ's resurrection and everything, this was their waiting place. This was their waiting place and all because Christ had to be the first one to raise, okay? He's the first fruits. That's the feast of the first fruits. He must come first and all before others can come after him, all right? I want you to understand that. And then we need to also understand that the events of the Gospels, the events of Jesus' life that we read of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, now understand this, is still under the law. It's still Old Testament, all right? In your Bible, that Bible that sits on your lap, when you get past the book of Malachi, you will come to a page that says the New Testament, right? There might be some information in there, but it's going to be the New Testament. And so when we ask what is the first book of the New Testament, 99 and 44, 100% of the people are going to say what? Matthew, yeah. Matthew right? Because it is. New Testament, Matthew. But what you need to keep in mind, is the events that took place there, Jesus' life ministry, were under the Old Covenant. All right? Under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is so forth. Matter of fact, the Bible says, and I think that Christ was born under the Old Covenant. Okay? He was under that law. That's why he was the obedient Jew that he was. Okay? And recognizing the Jewish law and the Jewish ceremonies and such. And besides, here's the thing. A covenant, a covenant is sealed by blood. What was that of the old covenant that sealed it? Remember the Passover lamb in Egypt? Okay. There's where the old covenant began. Where did the new covenant begin? With the Passover lamb and the new in Jesus. Okay. Go to Matthew chapter 26. You don't have to go there. You just write it down. But go to Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus is observing the Passover with his disciples. Okay. From that Passover, he takes two elements. What were they? Come on, speak it out. Okay, bread and cup, right? He said, this bread, this is my body, which was broken, right? And then he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the what? New Testament, you see. 
that is shed for many. And so it is with the shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God that the New Testament was now enacted. And so with that, with that in mind, the first book of the New Testament is what? Acts. Yeah, the book of Acts. First book of the New Covenant. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the events there are under the old, you see. And so when a person died in faith, it all wasn't heaven. It was a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And all until Christ's resurrection. And then, as the scriptures say, he led captivity captive. Okay? And he took those with him. Because now, in the new covenant, what does the Bible say? For the child of God to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Thank you. Present with the Lord. And where is Christ today? The Bible said that he ascended. Okay? He ascended back to his father. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, send it back and all. And he took his position on the right hand and serves now as our high priest and mediator, right? Y'all getting the, this has got to be muddy to you and everything, but I just got to bring this stuff out. I want you to make sure you get this so we understand the context of this, okay? If you get totally confused, if you don't get anything out, just keep this in mind. There is one of two places after this, all right? Okay? There's, and, that, and that is determined upon what you do with Christ here. Okay? So I want you to get a hold of that. Now, let's move on for just a moment. Let's look there. Hell. We take, first of all, you see that Lazarus was comforted, but not so with this rich man. Matter of fact, it's pretty poignant there. In verse 22, it said, The rich man also died and was buried. Now notice, and in hell. Okay? And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in what? Torment. There was no ease there. There was no comfort. You know, how many of y'all remember uh, a cartoon used to be in the paper and such called The Far Side? Y'all remember that, Paul? You remember that? Gary Larson was the writer of that. And um, uh, he, used to, he used to show, you know, pictures of hell. And, they, and yeah, there were flames there, but other than that, you know, there's different rooms you could go to. These people sit in front of a fan, you know, and it, it just wasn't all that bad a place to be. But if you look here, the Bible says, look, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in what? Torments. And then he explains that there's flame here, okay? So this is something that's going, and here's the thing I want you to remember. Get a hold of this, too. It's not like a person or their soul would hit hell and then burn up in flame. No, 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 no. I want you to understand this is eternal. This is everlasting. This is never ending. As heaven is eternal for the child of God, hell is eternal for those who reject. Okay? We get a hold of that? Everybody understand? Okay? We agree? We see what we're talking about? So I want you to understand that as we look at this, and all hell is a place of conscious torment. Conscious torment. This man wasn't unconscious. He wasn't numb to what's going on and everything. He is experiencing what this place is all about. Notice that he didn't lose. He didn't lose his senses, did he? He didn't lose his sight. How do we know that? He saw Abraham. He saw Abraham and Lazarus. He could see. He had a sight. We also see that he had his touch. Man, I mean, I'm tormented. I can feel this is what's going on. I can feel it. And they, he had his hearing because he conversed, didn't he? They spoke. And they had a conversation there in that. So, folks, I want to point out to you here. God says, whosoever will may come. We believe that. Amen? Know what the Bible says? Whosoever will may come. All those that come unto me, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast out. So we believe. We believe that. that thing. But I want you to understand this, that whosoever will in at physical death. You don't make the decision after you die. Okay? You make that decision while you're here. Okay? You make that decision while you're here. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 tells us that it is appointed unto man 15 times to die. Thank you. One time. Once to die, you see. And then what's interesting after that is the judgment, isn't it? It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Yes, there will be an accounting. And we need to grasp that. 
There was a book some years ago. And it might still be available. I don't know. I can't even remember who the author was. But it's called Voices from the Edge of Eternity. Okay, if, if you're good with the computer and everything, maybe Amazon or Christian Book or whatever, you know, look that up. Voices from the Edge of Eternity. And basically what it was, it was recorded deathbed confessions. Okay? Of, of those saved and those lost. And, what, and how diametrically opposed they were to one another. You know, those who, who knew Christ as their Savior and everything talked about, you know, just a, a peace. Remember that one song, there's a peaceful, easy feeling? You know, remember the eagles and everything? So, you know, yeah, that, that's what they saw. You know, and, and they, they just heard wonderful things like that. And there was no, no, no agony or, or anything like that. It was a very peaceful thing. And then those outside of faith in Jesus Christ, and in that many of them and everything, that they cried out that they could literally feel flame lapping at them. And then they pass out into that eternity, you see. I challenge you, if you can find that book, get it. I want you to realize again, there's one or two places based on what you have done with Jesus Christ. You know, even the, even that rich man, he suddenly became very compassionate, didn't he? I've got some brothers Hey, would you send Lazarus so he can go to them and everything? Because you know what? I mean, here's one coming back from the dead. You're going to listen to somebody like that, right? I mean, let's face it. If you're sitting in your living room and a knock comes on the door and it's your long-lost relative that died 15 years ago standing there, you're going to believe what they say. Either that or you're going to faint, one of the two, you know? And so this is what he said. Send him. Send him. They'll believe him. Abraham said, no, look, they've got the word. they got the word of God. they got Moses and the prophets. If they're not listening, if they're not believing that, they're not going to believe one coming back from the dead. You know, what I see in that is that fantastic events, I don't think, is what God intends to reach people. Now, I'm not saying crusades and things like that, you know, where you hear of multiple people getting saved. Or I, I, I'm not being critical of that. But I am convinced more and more, and I think as you look into the Word of God, that God's plan is for God's people to go to those that they know and share the gospel with them. Whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's work associates, whether whatever it might be. God has placed us here with a purpose to be salt and light, with a purpose to be his testimony, with a purpose to be his witness. Because here's the bottom line, folks. If people don't hear about the love of God from us, then where are they going to hear it from? Where are they going to hear it from? That's why we're here. We're, you know, we sit back and say, man, thank God I'm saved. Oh, Lord, I'm thankful that you came. I'm thankful you shed your blood. I'm thankful that you forgave me of my sin. And I'm thankful my name is in the book of life. And that you're going to come back. And I'm going to go praise God for that. But what about the person that sits next to you at work? What about a son and daughter? Or a grandchild? What about that neighbor? You've been a neighbor with them for 30 years. Have you ever considered their soul? That, that, that's, what's, that's what's being communicated here. There's a reality here, folks. And whether people believe there's a heaven or hell or not makes no difference because God said there is. And that's what matters. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus was telling his disciples of how things were going to be before he comes, before he returns. And you remember those, don't you? Wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, such as like that. Well, also one of the things he says is that the love of many shall wax cold. Shall wax cold. And you know what? We look around our world today, we see the violence today, and okay, that resonates with us, doesn't it? That resonates with us. Everything. The love of many wax and cold. But here's where I get out of that. You remember what Jesus told the church at Ephesus? There in chapter 3 of Revelation? He had all kinds of good things to say about it. 
Man, he said, hey, you guys, your attendance is great. Hey, the way you give, that's wonderful and everything. Listen, I appreciate you doing this, and you're taking care of things and all, and that is wonderful. But you know what? I've got one thing that I'm not really happy at, and that's you've lost your first love. And I firmly believe, everything, I firmly believe that we have lost, we have lost a love for the lost. You see what I'm saying? We've lost our love for them. God loves them. Okay? For God so loves just the church people. The world. Oh, the world. Thank you, Nathaniel. The world. Red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in His sight. Amen? Yeah. And we can even broaden that out and everything. It don't matter their, you know, their lifestyle, what they claim to be, this, that, the other, and everything. God just said, you know what? I love them. I love them. That's why Christ came. And that's where it's our responsibility to share that with them. So that they can come to know the God that you and I know. So that they can come and have the assurance that you and I have, you see. And they can come to have the hope that you and I rest in in our walk with Jesus Christ. It's so easy to become hardened, to become frustrated, to become, I don't know, just ready to check out when we look at our culture today. I get that way, you know. I think of after an evening there at Lowe's and everything on the drive home and everything, I just think of how aggravated I get with people, how tired I get of this. Why do people do this? Why do people dress like this? Why do people, act, you know, why do we just see all this stuff? But then I'm reminded. It could very well be that, you know what, they just don't know. You and I know, but they don't, you see. Who's going to tell them? Hey, just have them tuned in to CNN, they'll find out, right? <laughs> well, that ain't going to work, you see. No, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Folks, let's not become hardened. Let's not allow the circumstances of life to, to, to so cumber us that we forget of a wonderful privilege that we have of being God's testimony and being His light and where others can come and have the same hope that you and I have. You know, i got to tell you something. i got to tell you something. You know, people without hope today, people without Jesus Christ today, and everything, I'll be, I don't know how they face circumstances of life. Really, if you stop and think about it, look what's going on in our world today. Look what's going on in our culture. This thing's going off the rails. We're saying, what's going to happen here? What's going on? Nobody knows. But you know what? You and I sit back and say, hey, guess what? Regardless of what happened, our God's in control. Amen. And we know that the bottom line is that one day, we're going to be with him. How bad can that be? Amen? Amen. You see. And that is our hope. That is how we can face each and every day in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But let's not be hardened, church. Let's not be hardened that we forget the reason why we're here. Okay? Because there are others that need the hope that we have. And that hope is Jesus Christ. Well, folks, thanks for joining us in our live stream here from Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And I trust that the message was an encouragement to your heart today. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry, or, you know, if there's something we can pray for you about or a spiritual question that we can answer, I want to encourage you to go to our website at sbbcfamily.com. That's for Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church Family. Dot com and just follow the prompts there and you can send your prayer request you can send your question and everything we'll get back to you as soon as possible but as always you're welcome to join us any sunday at 10 30 a.m right here in uh, stephen city located right between route 11 and i-81 so uh, come and see us sometime but until then i pray the lord bless you i pray the lord keep you and that the lord shine his face upon you